welcome to Transformative Principle, where I help you stop putting out fires and start leading. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Welcome to Transformative Principle. Today, I am excited to have Michael Toth on the show. He is the founder and CEO of Learning Sciences International, and he leads LSI's Applied Research Center. He is the author of the multi-award winning book, The Power of Student Teams with David Sousa, author of Who Moved My Standards, and co-author with Robert Marzano of The Essentials of a Standards-Driven Classroom, School Leadership for Results and Teacher Evaluation That Makes a Difference. Michael gives public presentations and advises leaders on the most critical issues in K-12 education today, including equity and access, academic rigor, and student agency. As a thought leader, Michael has moderated high-level events such as roundtable discussions between some of the nation's top superintendents on topics like reimagining the schools of the future. Excited to have Michael with me today. So, Michael, I want to start by talking about um, the school that you worked with in Florida, I believe it was Lakewood Elementary School, and you took that school from an F, the lowest school in the state, to an A after they partnered with you. And I, I think that, that that story is really powerful, and so I'd like to, to talk to you about that and get some perspective and, and some of the things that you think about as you're going in to work with a school that is struggling so much like that school was. Sure. That's it. And by the way, one of my, my favorite schools I visited there often as our teams were in working with it. When we first were uh, contracted by the district and in Florida, it's called an external operator. It basically means they uh, contract with us to operate the school instructionally, uh, turn it around, then we give it back to the district. That was the lowest performing public school in the state, traditional public school, the state of Florida, it's a big state. When our teams got there to do their assessment, they were literally breaking up student fights to get to the school. It was what we call a condition school. Yeah. Parents were kind of wandering the hallways. They just didn't have their procedures put together. Um, Folks were firefighting, you know, what I mean, where they have the walkies on and it's kind of like a a vest and they're they're trying to maintain control and and working really hard we move that very very quickly but that it it required us to first of all put in systems of safety and care which is very very important starting place but not good enough because that'll get you a bump getting kids under control, getting behaviors under control, getting the right teachers in the classroom, the right leader of the school absolutely is is part of the pathway. But what we find often is these schools go to over control and very, very prescriptive approaches. Um, Well, and let me just stop you right there real quick, because that is something that we, I, I, I say a lot, if safety is our priority, then learning cannot be. And our schools need to be safe. I'm not arguing that. But if that is the only thing that we're focusing on or the thing we're spending all of our time doing, we're never going to get to the learning aspect because we're so worried about safety. So it needs to happen. It's important. But learning really has to be the priority. And once things are safe, then you can shift and make sure learning is a priority. And you sum that up really beautifully. And that's why I wanted to stop and just highlight it because it matters a lot to be safe But that's that can't be the goal. And sometimes we make decisions where safety comes before learning and we need to have psychological safety to be sure. But we also need to just get the work done and not be deterred by something that may not be a perfect situation or get that to derail us from being a learning institution. Yeah, so what we we call that overcorrection, overcorrection mm-hmm. of control. And what'll happen is whenever you take a school like Wake Lakewood and, and get it in control, you actually get a learning bump just out of because yeah. of <laughs> functionality of behavior. And um, so folks think if I double down on that sometimes that'll keep giving me gains, but it it, it doesn't. So 
we're very conscious of having enough control, but what we don't want to do is suppress student agency. So the, the students coming to this community are 100% free and reduced lunch. It's uh, nearly 100% uh, minority school. But it is a wonderful community that wants the best for their children, even though they're going through lots of economic hardships and other things. So a year later, I walk the school and my after my teams have come in and we've got those things corralled and there was nothing but love in this school and I think whenever we do what we call an LSI school it has a feel and a look and in that case we saw children reaching out to adults adults reaching out to kids everywhere you're doing the crawl in the laps they will mm -hmm. parents will come in and um talk about their children before they want to do that and it's just the whole community rallied around the school then the next phase and this is such an important phase is building student agency so all students are capable of high levels of agency but they don't all come to school with that well-developed advantage yes. kids typically do disadvantaged and vulnerable students often do not but they're fully capable so if we just control them we we can't actually go to rigor and so rigor and agency are actually highly intertwined and when i'm talking about agency it's not just self-regulation we are talking about building the capacity to be a really great student and what i mean by that they can set academic goals they can self-regulate around achieving those goals they track their progress and they make correction changes whenever it's not going the way they are hoping it would be going. So they're reflecting on that, developing persistence. These are the things that are what you know often called soft school skills or the whole child, but they're absolutely critical. And like just a story, you know, I grew up in poverty. That's why this our social mission for Learning Sciences International is to end generational poverty and eliminate racial achievement gaps. This is how we do it. We have to build the capacity of the student. And so we use a process called academic teaming to do that. That's where we put structures and responsibilities and we release students to it. And then you have to feed that team rigor. And that would, for that, I'll... I'll Rigor is something well talked about, but not always well understood. Yeah, so let's pause there for just a minute. And I want to really highlight the power of this student agency piece, because I, I love what you said, that all students are capable of student agency. And one of the pieces of pushback that I've gotten a lot is that, yes, you can do that in a high socioeconomic school, but you can't do that in a low socioeconomic school. And I rebel against that notion because it's just not true. It's saying that just because you happen to be poor, you can't have the abilities that everybody else has. And I've interviewed several people who have also come from poverty on this podcast and have become amazing people. The most amazing one that I can think of is, um, of course, his name just left me. He's the CEO <laughs> of Scribe Media, Javon uh, McCormick. There we go. So Javon McCormick, had a mom who was a prostitute and a dad who was a pimp and had a very difficult childhood and it was challenging in so many ways and yet he figured out a way to become successful by any standard that you can imagine and whenever we say you can't do this in low ses communities we then say those kids aren't worth trusting or supporting or giving the tools that they need uh, how would you respond to that i we also run into that and it's a skepticism. So what I, when somebody says my kids, you know, can't do that. I mean, I, I reframe that as you don't know how, but they right. absolutely can. Yes. So in our applied research center, we spent a decade figuring out how to bring rigor and agency together uh, so that we can develop the whole child and break generational poverty. And, and this is the promise of public schools. Public schools are the first system these kids are going to hit. And it's the one that can make the difference. And it, but it must add value. It must lift them out and not perpetuate 
these situations. And one, one of those is like over controlling the kids. So our pedagogy, what we have to recognize, and I, I, it's one of the speeches, keynotes that I do. I, I go through photos going back to the beginning of photography of classrooms. And you know what's stunning? It hasn't, it has changed and it hasn't changed. Yeah. Here's what hasn't changed. The, the clothing certainly has changed. The rigidity has changed. Classrooms today are certainly much better than they were back then. But it's still somebody in front of the classroom holding most of the talking and students as dependent and compliant learners. If we're going to break generational poverty, we have to core instruction, tier one instruction must transition students from dependent compliant learners to independent critical thinkers. You can't do that unless you let the kids talk. Now, what teachers... Teachers instinctively know that when kids come to them without well-developed agency, if they give them autonomy, they'll lose control of the classroom. What we do is we don't release autonomy to kids. What we do is get trained. It's actually almost professional development for students, but we give them strategies on how to have structures, roles, norms, and those norms of conduct, they enforce so that they can have healthy and robust debate around content. And that's that's when you really see students start elevating. We've taken well over a thousand classrooms of Title I students. The students aren't supposed to be able to do this. Right. And they blossom beautifully. The biggest stories that I can can tell you is particularly to change for African-American males that had been uh, oftentimes relegated as, quote, troublemakers and discipline problems. Here's what we find. They're really smart, but they're frustrated because they don't like this system of control. They don't know how to express it. Whenever they get into academic teaming, more often than not, they become the team leader and lead the other students in their learning. The transformation is so powerful, and the teachers are the ones reporting this to us. But when we talk to them, they didn't, they never had an opportunity to lead. Nobody believed in their ability to be a good student. And as soon as we got a culturally responsive learning environment, I think this is really important. Culturally responsive learning environment is indeed a learning environment when students can bring their identities, bring their cultures, and express it in a, in a learning community. And that's what we would have as a team versus just some strategies we throw on teacher-centered instruction and claim it's culturally responsible. Yeah, and, and I think what's really key there is it, it, this probably bears out as teachers start doing it, that they see results and see the success of the kids doing it. And if the data doesn't convince them, then them seeing it in person is what really does. And that's something that I've seen too, is that once they see what kids are capable of, then they believe and say, oh yeah, this kids can do this now. And they've always been able to, but the, the adults just didn't believe it. Is that what you're seeing also? A hundred percent. So what we see is the first time we take teachers through this. Uh, and I, I, I I'm very big on granting grace to schools, to administrators, to teachers, all working hard. They're, they're working crazy hard, too hard, in my opinion. We've got to get the students engaged in working harder on their own learning. Yes. So whenever we're bringing that skilling in, and it is a new skill because teachers do not learn as a full service. I wish they did, but they don't. They learn teacher-centered classroom management procedures and instruction. That's what their professors are modeling. That's what they experienced when they were in school. And that's what we keep perpetuating, these legacy systems. But we need to change it because diverse learners don't learn well in that environment. That's really majority cultural learning. I'm not even sure it does well for majority culture, to be honest with you. But if you have advantaged enough parents, you'll learn just fine. Right. <laughs> because they tutor you. They're going to check yeah. your homework. You know, I didn't, that wasn't my background. I, I didn't have that home support. 
and that's one reason I'm so passionate about that. Every child can break the bonds of poverty, can break the bonds that there's no fault of their own if schools develop this high level of agency with rigor. So whenever we have students form teams, and we use um, a lot of research based out of this in my last book, The Power of Student Teams, I go over it in, in detail. But we see students have real empathy for each other. The dialogue, I was just visiting a school where I walked kindergarten classrooms and the kindergartners were self-regulating in groups. This is Title I school. And this they're saying to each other, what's your evidence to support your claim? And they're serious. Yeah, they're not messing around. (laughs) No, they're not playing. They're learning. They're capable of this. We've seen in preschool as well, but typically we work K-12. And then I'll find a high school teacher that's certain that their kids aren't going to be able to do it. So let's go walk a kindergarten classroom. Yeah, totally. That's the level, because they were actually bumping out of retrieval and into comprehension. Mm-hmm. We're going up the taxonomy levels. In kindergarten, that's really amazing. Yeah. So the thing that is amazing to me is that kids will do whatever you teach them to do, right? Because they they can learn, all of them, no matter disability or race or anything, they can learn and then they can do that same thing on their own later. And that example of a kindergartner asking what is your evidence of this claim is really powerful because you can see that. So my daughter, when she was in preschool several years ago, she, they did this thing called plan, do, review. And it's what my wife and I first saw that our kids could comprehend setting goals for themselves at an early age. And so since my kids were probably like in the five or six range, we've been setting goals every single week with them about what they want to accomplish. And my, my youngest daughter wanted to, uh, be a hula hoop master and she got a hula hoop (laughs) and she said, my goal this week is to hula hoop for 30 seconds. And that was a big deal for her. The next week she said, my goal is to hula hoop for five minutes. And then the next week she said, I think I'm done because I hula hooped for 20 minutes. And after a while, it just got too much. And But the thing is, is like, we didn't ever tell her, Michael, you need to be better at hula hooping. We set the framework for her to make goals for herself and then work to achieve them. We didn't say you need to go out and practice hula hooping. That's your goal because that's not our place. Our place is to make sure she knows that she's accountable to herself for her goals. And once once we've done that, our kids have excelled and blossomed in ways that are just amazing. And when we give kids the agency to do that, then they they rise up to the task, especially if we give them the right scaffolding, supports, and structures to help them be successful at it. That's a wonderful story, and I wish every parent did what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I do think advantaged parents often do it by what you'll often find, particularly college-educated parents, is they're constantly teaching, Mm -hmm. explaining. They're going grocery shopping, and they're reading labels, and they're talking about how measures, and they're modeling. They will um, help their students put calendars together. When's a test coming up? Like, they're literally teaching agency. Mm -hmm. And again, I came back. I had none of that from uh, my home support. And uh, I wasn't dealing with other stuff that that often these children have to deal with. And so when we come into school, if we actually intend to develop the whole child, this is how you do it. So I applaud the movement for social emotional learning. However, it should not be segregated from core instruction. You shouldn't have it. The L block and then have kids sit in seats and and lecture to them. 
we should have it integrated. So what we're talking about is integrated SEO and academics, which is actually what the objective of SEO is. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with Castle, and that is where it's supposed to go, is you're supposed to integrate these things. To do that, we have to let kids talk. We have to give them roles and responsibilities. We have to allow them to flourish. I remember walking in a classroom, and there was a student um, – with a uh, IEP, he had a disability. He was so excited. He came up to me and uh, the superintendent and I was walking with, he says, I have a job. I have a job on my team. He was so excited to have a responsibility, an academic responsibility and to deliver that. And that's, that's what I'll see when we typically walk in schools the first time we hear teacher voice teach students only uh, responding compliantly if they're questioned. Yeah. When we're done, we hear very noisy classrooms, but it's good noise. It's yeah. on task. They're learning. But one thing we have to get really clear is teaching and learning are two distinct different processes. One, the teacher does one the student does one. You have to be silent to listen to the teacher. But if you're learning, you have to process and you have to share and you have to work out your ideas. That's the only way we get kids from, you know, retrieval to comprehension. You have to process together, not just independently. And then analysis. Well, we have to examine each other's reasoning. We have to develop new mental models. And lastly, the highest level, we should apply that learning to something. Well, you can't do that without talking. It's actually not possible for most children. And that's one reason where we have to put in structures so students know how to learn, how to process content, how to be masters of their own learning. But this really is not difficult once you know how to do it. It's scalable. And we've had teachers love it. Teachers will say to me two things. I didn't know my kids could do that. That's the first thing. And that's true. It's simply because they didn't know how. Mm -hmm. The second one, and I love this, my kids are learning without me. What do I do? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> exactly right. So, and, and when you get, form a team, an academic team in your classroom, you have to feed them more rigorous task. Board teams are not good. They'll find something to do. So you have That's to, right. they're really built for rigor. And uh, one of our, our issues here, and, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking very broadly, we do have, particularly where we have students of color and students from poverty, there's this idea that we have to prescribe and teacher proof stuff. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is removing agency and skills from teachers. And we're able to build those up very quickly. It has not been a problem, but I worry about that over time because you know what? These are the teachers we need to be there. These are tough schools to teach in. We need to teach to invest in teachers and believe in them and show them how to do rigor and agency in the classroom and how to make this transformation. Because when we quote prescribe it, what will happen is it removes ownership from the teacher yeah. and it just flows down into a compliance teaching and learning environment. And there's very little learning in a compliance environment. Yeah, absolutely. So can you delve into that a little bit more? Let me tell you what I think you're saying and you can tell me if I'm reading it correctly or not. What I think you're saying is that we need to give teachers the tools to increase student agency but also help them feel like they are continuing to be involved in that process without them being in control of that process. Is, is that a fair summary of what you said, or am I missing the mark somewhere? Yeah, so there's a real partnership that you have to phase this in. At first, we do teacher-directed groups, but then we transition to student-led groups. As the students develop the agency and prove they can do it. But that continuum would continue to, you know, self-directed learners. And that has always been the highest goal of a classroom, but almost rarely obtained, except for private schools where you're paying, what, 50 grand a year. There's no reason we can't have that in public schools if we develop agency with rigor as we go along.
Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with that. And the challenge is, is that as I was a principal trying to do that in my school, I got a lot of pushback from my teachers thinking that if I turn this over to the students, uh, I'm going to be held accountable for their their poor performance. And what I found was that if you if you really have student directed classrooms, then the learning is way deeper and they learn way more than you would otherwise. I I, I can't agree more. So whenever we're doing that, we and, and a part of this is is in research, there's something called perverse effects. That's when the opposite of something good you're intending actually happens. I think what you're talking about is one of those bad effects of, of high accountability where teachers are worried about the test. Mm -hmm. Here's the truth. Deeper learning. If you get your kids to deeper learning, they test better because they can figure out the problems. They can write, they can reason their way through the test. Yeah. Otherwise, we're condemning them to memorization and recall and test prep. That is an awful existence as a student. Honestly, there's no joy there. And I think we've lost the joy in teaching and lost the joy as being a student, particularly in the most needy schools. It's just test, 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 prepare for the test. Very counterproductive, and it doesn't work. You cannot push kids. Kids have to. You can push them to a point. But to get student ownership, they will zoom mm -hmm. as soon as you ignite student ownership. And you can't do that as long as they're passive and compliant. We're just essentially teaching to them without involving them and giving them some ownership of their learning process. Yeah. And it's so vital for us to do that, because if we don't, then they can... <laughs> I, I hate to rat on my daughter's teachers, but she's in eighth grade in algebra right now. And she is, she took a test last week and she said the night before, I just do not get how to do this stuff that we need to do. And it's like, I don't know, it's very frustrating. So I, I said, well, just do your best and what you don't get, you know, you can talk with your teacher later and figure out what you need to do better. So she goes and takes the test and then she ends up getting a, perfect score on it and she didn't think that she had the information but she and she is not in a student driven student directed classroom at all for sure and it is very much teacher centric dispensing of information and the reason why she didn't get it was because the teacher didn't explain it to her in a way that she understood and that's the only way to get it so she she didn't know what to do but she ended up guessing on the test was able to get it right and now she's like what do I do now? I have no motivation to study because I didn't know what I was doing and I still passed the test. And I have no motivation to get better at this because it doesn't matter because my teacher's just going to tell me what to do. And I struggle with this as a parent because I want her to excel in math and I think it's important, but she sees no value in it. And it's very frustrating as a parent to watch this happen. Well, a lot of empathy for your daughter because it sounds like how I learned math. Yeah. But that's let me contrast that by one of our schools for rigor and equity, where we really it's a demonstra national demonstration model that we do with schools. And I'll give you a third grade math classroom, and it, it just blows you away walking in because they're don't teaching mathematical reasoning and making a puzzle. And trying to solve the problems in different ways. And then they have to figure out what the right way is. Not the right one way, but to get to the right answer. And they're, they're literally playing with numbers the way a student mathematician would. And this is not a wealthy school. And I remember debriefing with the teacher because she had them in teams and she would go through this process. They are so engaged. They're having so much fun in math. I never had fun in a math class, ever. <laughs> well, never had fun in a math class. It was a little raucous. She had a debate going on. They would say, what's the answer? And she said, no, you're going to figure it out. And they went all the way down. To, they got to the correct answer. And then they had to analyze and do a gallery walk of all the different ways they figured out to get there. That's cool. That is cool and fun. 
and fun. And they got up and they were moving around and they were debating. And she would throw out a hint if they struggled too much, but never gave the answer. Now, contrast that I was walking with a, uh, rep- a uh, district leader of another uh, district that was thinking of doing what we're, what we're doing. And they ended up doing it, but she was getting a little anxious. She goes, when's she going to give them the answer? And I said, just wait, just, <laughs> just wait, wait, yeah. just wait, because she gives the answer, learning's over, game yep. over. Yep. So it we call this productive struggle and productive struggle actually can be fun. Yeah. Productive struggle. Let me, let me quit it this way. When you go to a gym and you lift weights, if you lift the same way every day, you're not going to get stronger or, or more fit. So you, you, every so often you have to up the weight and it's, it, you struggle a little bit, then it becomes normal. It becomes your baseline. That's how the brain develops. Mm-hmm. We cannot deny a productive struggle to children or we actually stunt their cognitive development. This is a big deal. So, but we want to bring in rigor that's fun, that's a challenge, and that they can work together like the environment I was describing to do it. That's when kids thrive. And that's, by the way, those kids were killing it on the state test yeah, because they could figure out problems. Yeah. And they became confident little mathematicians. I never had confidence in math because like that, I remember missing a question on a test, going up to the teacher, because I kept missing it. And he said, I can't give you the answer because it's going to be on the rest of my test. So I just messed <laughs> it the whole year. I'm like, I, it didn't make any sense as I was a student. And it still doesn't make any sense. That's right. And, and that's such a great example of thinking that we're doing something good when we're really not. And I, this, is, this has been a great conversation. The last question I always ask is, what is one thing a principal can do this week to be a transformative leader like you? So we've talked about a lot, but narrow it down to just one action step somebody can take. Walk your classrooms and listen. Who's talking more? Students? Or the teacher, are they talking to each other? Are they talking about the content? If they are, you've already moved your school further than many schools are. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, Michael, this has been so great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, for being here. And um, I'll definitely put links to LSI and your book, uh, The Power of Student Teams, um, in the show notes. so People can check those out as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Jethro.